Good morning. It is good to see everyone. We are short. You might keep some families in prayer. Bethany and Shelby have sick ones or a sick one at home. Chris and Sarah also. Tara, I'm sorry. Chris and Tara. I knew that. Thank you, Nancy, for singing with the, the children. Those songs have a little bit of a... They're a little more creative, a little different than what we've done in the past movements. The first one, she said, choose a partner. I turned around and saw Nathan behind me and... I was just going to say, I was looking forward to using him as my partner until I saw that he was poking his nose and bumping his shoulder. <laughs> I was glad to see he wasn't there when it came time for that. <laughs> and here I get in trouble for saying, turn to the person next to you, shake, your, shake their hand, tell them you're glad they're here. It makes everyone feel awkward. <laughs> turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to be moving on to the next passage this morning. As Nathan said in our uh, Sunday school, it was, uh, it was all 1 Corinthians moving around. It was really uh, good to see that, just the, uh, the way he hit on several different spots that we've been looking at as we've moved through now to the, the fourth chapter. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, the text we're going to be looking at this morning. Let's read that and then we'll open with prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Let's pray. Father, pray that as we open up your word and begin to look at it carefully in the context of this letter in the context of that city and that church and the things they were going through help us to understand how it applies to us the difficulties that Paul faced as a as a preacher as a leader in that church how the people evaluated him and how they measured him how many of them rejected him Father, as we, as we look at the idea of a pastor today, a preacher today, as we look at the idea of our own ministry among the, the body, each of us ministering to one another, help us to see here characteristics that we should have, that a minister should have. Help us to understand that in the end, uh, we will stand before Christ and be judged for what we've done. Help us to have a thick skin to some degree and to receive criticism and sometimes abuse and mistreatment. Help us to understand, Father, that uh, we're serving you, not, not others, not men. But also, Father, help us to understand that in a sense we are. We are serving others, caring for and building up others. And so in another sense, we should have a, a tender skin and be very sensitive but help us to understand these, these characteristics. Help us to understand how to apply this to our situation. Not to receive praise too heartily. <laughs> Not to believe praise too much. And with the same goes with criticism, Father. Help us to evaluate ourselves. But in the end, Father, help us to keep that in mind that we will one day stand before Christ an answer for how we have ministered in your body. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Paul starts off this portion of his letter saying this, this is how you should regard us, us apostles, us ministers, as we work among you, as we serve among you. You should regard us as servants. As stewards. 
kind of an interesting combination if you think about it. One is lowly, about as low as you can go, and the other is an elevated position. As one, one author put it, underlings of Christ and overseers for God. <laughs> It's amazing what God's Word does with just a few precise words. Add to those words the word uh, the, the, add to those words that a steward is to be trustworthy, faithful. And you have the basic structure, you have the basic bones of what a minister of God is to be and the standards by which that minister is to be evaluated, how the, how the congregation relates to him, how he relates to the congregation just in three Precise words. You know, the, the habit of the Corinthians, as we have said, of evaluating their ministers according to popularity, according to personality, making celebrities of them, lifting them up, that is not at all a correct way to view ministers, not, not a correct way to evaluate ministers. So we're, we're still on this main point that Paul has been hammering home for some time, the divisions that were occurring there in the church over different ministers, making celebrities of them, ranking them. And Paul is saying you should not be ranking pastors or ministers or, or teachers. If they are teaching true to God's Word, they are all again, as we saw a couple weeks ago, merely servants. Working together. They serve Christ. And they're going to be judged by Christ. And Christ's judgment is really all they need to concern themselves with. Behind all this, as we'll see as we move further into chapter 4, is a disrespect for Paul. If some are saying, I am of Apollos, and some are saying, I am of Peter, or I am of Christ, by saying that, they're showing their aversion to Paul. I am certainly not of Paul. I follow Cephas, right? They see him as weak. They see him as foolish. They question his apostleship. And this, in fact, we see there in verse 3 maybe a, a, a hint that they were forming a human court, a, an ecclesiastical court of some sort where they were going to try Paul where they were going to put his credentials up there and, and, and make a verdict over him, judging his worthiness. You know, that's unfortunate for Paul, but it's fortunate for us. I, I got to thinking about this, what Paul was going through there, kind of like a heresy in a church. When, when heresy is brought into a church, when a, when a doctrine is, is all of a sudden questioned and someone is teaching it in a different direction, that's unfortunate, that's scary, that's, that's a bad direction, but in another sense it's helpful for the church because it helps the church become very precise about that teaching. What is it that we really believe? And what we see here this morning is the, the way they were treating Paul ends up giving us a very biblical, inspired lesson or teaching on what a minister is and how he should be evaluated, how he should be viewed. So Paul shows us three characteristics of a servant of Christ. We're going to see his identity, his requirements, and his evaluation. His identity, his requirements, and his evaluation. Now before you begin to think that this sermon doesn't apply to me because I'm not a minister in the church, turn with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'll show you that in one sense, in a very true sense, you are a minister in the church. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, As each one received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So in one way, in a very true way, it is correct to see yourself referred to here in this passage. In fact, Peter, uh, chapter 2, says that every one of us make up a royal priesthood. 
So we are ministering to one another. I remember, I can't remember who it was, someone talking about, uh, may have been Chip Ingram, talking about all of the people in the church who were going to visit one of the members of the church in the hospital. And, and after, you know, the 10th, 11th, 12th member of the congregation had come to the hospital saying, I need to see him, I'm his minister. The hospital got a clue of what was actually going on. <laughs> these aren't his ministers, but these people are his body and they're ministering to him. So we're all gifted by the Holy Spirit to help the body grow. And we're all, we all should be working as a team, as we're seeing this emphasis lately here in, in Paul's letter, to serve the body. We are stewards, and it is required of every one of us to be trustworthy with that, to be faithful with that. So first, look at the minister's identity. Look at verse 1. This is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The first word that Paul uses to help us understand how to identify uh, a, a minister is the word servant. Now we can learn a lot by looking at this word, by focusing on this word for a minute or two. It's not the usual word that Paul would use for servant. It's not doulos. It's not a, it's not a slave. It's, it's not another word that Paul uses often to speak of sometimes women in the church who were serving, a diakonos. It's not just a servant. In fact, it is a, a, a word that's even harder to say. Huperitos, I believe is how you say it. Huperitos. It's, it literally means an under rower. A galley slave who helped row a massive ship. Now remember... This is Corinth, and Cor Corinth was an isthmus, another very hard word for me to say, uh, a strip of land with seas on both sides, okay? And you remember when we introduced the letter, we talked about that these large ships, large merchant vessels would come up and port there in Corinth, and then would be dragged, drug across land to the other side instead of taking days to go around. So picture in your mind these large ships porting in Corinth and all of a sudden these slaves from down under in the belly of the ship being unshackled because they're shackled to their spot with ankle shackles. They're unshackled. They come out and they begin 100, 200, 300 of them depending on the size of the ship actually taking ropes and somehow with a mechanism they had devised dragging that ship across land to the other side. Galley slaves. That's, that's the word that, that Paul is using here. The ship would have a crew that spent most of their time on deck and would sleep just under deck and in their, their bunks and things like that. The ship would have a cargo hold where, where product, where their, uh, their cargo would, would be stored, their merchandise. And then under that would be the galley slaves, the engine, <laughs> the ones who made the ship go. And think about this. Paul chose this word extremely carefully. He's only, I, I believe he only used that word here. He purposefully did not use the other words for, for servant that he normally used. This is the most menial of slaves. The lowest of all of them. They didn't have a say in where the ship was going. They didn't have a say in how fast they should be rowing. They did not have a union, did they? <laughs> they didn't know what they didn't. They didn't have anything to do with with when they got a break. Their duty was simply to obey orders, right? When they were told to pick up the cadence to do triple time, they didn't have a clue whether it meant that captain just wanted to do a little better on his time or if they were being chased by a ship that was going to destroy him or out running a storm. All they had to do was obey. Listen to what was told to them and receive those orders. As ministers, think about this. As ministers of Christ, we are to see ourselves as servants. The lowest of servants in a very true sense. Taking orders from Christ and obeying Him. We're not to be men pleasers, swaying from our, our duty because people around us don't appreciate what we're doing because it's not tickling their fancy. Think about this for a second. Look at Christ. Picture Christ as the head of the church, the head of the body, the groom caring for His bride, the church. When we serve Christ, we do our best serving of the body, don't we? 
when we listen to His Word and respond in obedience, that is the most loving thing we can do for this body, for the family. Our obedience to Him means blessing to the church. Think about those galley slaves for a minute. There was not a ranking down there. There wasn't any celebrity rowers among them. They were all equal. They were all equally uh, mistreated. They all had it equally hard. Look back up at chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. No ranking. Paul is repeating this again and again, isn't he? No celebrities. We're all working for the same goal, the same objective. This word for servant was used in Luke chapter 4, verse 20. And you think about this for a minute. I, didn't, I totally forgot this man existed, and I think that's the point. Is Jesus got up to read in the synagogue. He took the scroll of Isaiah. He opened it up and he read a prophecy about himself. And then he said, today in your hearing, this is fulfilled. And he rolled it up and handed it to a no-name servant who went and took that and put it in its spot, that scroll. Same exact word. When I first started preaching here, for a certain amount of time, <clears throat> I read through First and Second Timothy daily. And just for a period of time, I don't know if it was a couple months or what, but and I did it at one setting to try to familiarize myself with the teaching of God, the teaching of Scripture, the teaching of the Holy Spirit towards or for a minister, for a young minister, for a, for a new minister. Because that's what Paul was writing to Timothy, right? And you get all sorts of direction from First and Second Timothy. I, I still can remember, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Practice these things, he says. Devote yourselves to them. Preach the Word. Keep a close watch on yourself, on your, on your teaching. You know, as we, as we employ our gifts... As we minister among the body, each of us should be daily listening, reading the Word. Listening for the call, listening for the, the cadence of the Master, you know. As, as that ship was making its way across, across the water, there was someone who was directing it with a cadence. And we get that direction from God's Word. How do we minister to one another? We do it very carefully by being obedient to His Word. In this Word, we get, a, we get again a, 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 a wonderful picture of teamwork. I don't think it's incidental either that he's repeating this. Paul has already stressed, he, he who plants and he who waters are one. They are fellow workers. We are working towards the same goal. We're working as a team. Working toward the same objective. We all have our hands on the same oar, going the same direction. I, uh, it's been a long time, but remember, we can all probably remember the canoe trips that we've been in. And as you start off with a group, there's always one canoe where the two or three people do not have it together. And they're not working together. And instead of moving down the river, they're turning and yelling at one another, right? There's a picture here of us working together because these guys were strapped to the oar. Three of them to an oar, two of them to an oar, de depending. So look at, look at the second word. Look at another word that Paul uses to describe the identity of a minister. It is stewards of the mysteries of God. It's a word that's used in the Bible to describe someone who is a supervisor over a large estate. 
a, a rich landowner would appoint someone, and it would usually be a slave, to do the routine work of running his estate, an administrator, right? Otherwise, that rich man found himself a slave to his own, his own large estate, trying to keep it running. He would assign it to someone else who then had the task of making sure everything went smoothly. Everything was done as it should. And that is, if you think about it, such a different word from a galley slave, isn't it? One is the lowest of the low. The other one is actually a position elevated above others, over all the other slaves. But this, this, this steward that we're looking at here has the overarching authority over everything. He is responsible for everything. Again, th think of 1 Peter 4.10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve another as good stewards of God's varied grace. As believers, you know, we all have a, a great stewardship. We've all been given so much by, by God, by Christ, by the Holy Spirit, gifts and enablings, blessings, and we are then to use it for His glory. Use each one of those for His glory, for others' good. But look at especially what we're talking about here in the text, because Paul is especially talking about ministers, preachers in, in the church. Look and see how a minister of Christ is a steward in a very special way. His specific duty is to be a steward of the mysteries of God. I remember MacArthur saying to a graduating class of seminarians, holding up a Bible and saying, this is the mine that you will work for the rest of your life. This is the field you will plow and cultivate. And this is the course of study that you will never graduate from. So the, the, God's Word, holding up the Bible. The minister's responsibility is to take God's Word and to feed the church with it. Use it to correct, use it to guide, use it to comfort, use it to exhort. And it is to be a correct exegesis of it. We need to keep that fresh on our minds. Truth taken from God's Word accurately and dispensed. If it is not, it is a dereliction of duty, isn't it? You are not at all doing what you should be doing. The, the admonition coming in verses 3 and 5 about not judging a servant, a minister of Christ, cannot be used to protect a false teacher. We need to be very clear on that, that this, this teaching where Paul says, look, I don't, I don't answer to you, so I don't really have to take every bit of criticism from you and take it to heart and change my, my way, that is not pointing at a false teacher, is it? A false teacher, 1 Timothy, as, we, as, we, as I said earlier, reading through 1 Timothy, trying to get a feel for what I am to do as a minister, it starts with a warning about false teachers. And directs a minister to be very careful to point out false teachers. But that leads us here to, to the requirement of the minister. Look at, look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Trustworthiness. Faithfulness. Think about this in relation to the problem at Corinth. They had their, their list of requirements to be met for their celebrity pastors, right? My celebrity pastor must be eloquent. He must be able to speak so well. Rhetoric, you know. Just be able to use all the latest Greek nuances and, and all of this. And he must be wise in the world's eyes, right? I mean, this is what Paul was, was dealing with. Uh, he must be able to out-debate every other philosophy. There's 50-some-odd philosophies in Corinth, and, and the, my celebrity pastor can just shut them all up, right? <laughs> must have a unique, attractive speaking ability. Today, think about what you hear. And I've heard this first one several times. I like my pastor because he cusses from the pulpit. <laughs> it's pitiful, isn't it? I like my pastor because he's funny. I like my pastor because he loves sports. And I can really relate to him. He loves the Chiefs and we just really, you know, he keeps me. <laughs> 
See, Paul was dealing with a, with a church, with a group of people who had their list of what they were looking for in, in a pastor. And Paul is saying, it's the wrong list. Paul says the most important thing is that he be faithful. Faithful to God's Word. Doing what he is supposed to be doing according to God's Word. Doing it in the way that God's Word says he should be doing it. So now think about you and your ministry and your work in the church. God is watching your work. God is judging. He is looking for faithfulness. He's not looking for a good sense of humor that keeps everyone's attention. He's looking for someone who's faithful, who's obedient. In your ministry, as you, we have a lot of people doing a lot of things in the church. Uh, and I'm not going to try to mention them because I'll leave some out. But a lot of people are active, working with different age groups, different people, men and women, and all of this. God is looking for faithfulness. Back up in chapter 3, verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So God is evaluating His workers, and He is looking for faithfulness. Turn back to Matthew 24 with me. Matthew 24, Jesus talking about His return talking about the end of the age, the end of time. Matthew 24, verses 36 through 39, and then we'll skip a couple verses and look at another. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. They go up to verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, he says. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set over him, he, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a picture of the servants of Christ. Are we faithfully working? Are we about our work? See, trustworthiness trumps eloquence, human wisdom, a good sense of humor. And Paul here is, is rejecting their standard for evaluating leaders. He and, and all of the leaders should be evaluated only by the standard of faithfulness to Christ. Is he faithfully taking God's Word and applying it, teaching it to the people's lives? And that leads us to the evaluation of the minister. Look at verses 3 and 4. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. This might sound like if you read it, and you're just moving through it, and you're not really thinking that Paul is elevating himself, that he could care less about what they think. The word judged there in verse 3 is the word for examined. 
to be examined by you, to be interrogated by you is a, really a small thing. Because I'm serving Christ and I answer to Christ. The Corinthians, remember, they were all about ranking their teachers, evaluating them on their own terms. And Paul says, yes, I am a, a galley slave. I am a servant to you and to Christ, but I am responsible to Christ and responsible to Him alone for what I do and how I do it. It would be very wrong for a pastor to be like a weather vane. And every time the wind turns, shifts, he turns and shifts and just does exactly what he feels the crowd wanting him to do. That's what a politician does. <laughs> Shamefully, that's what a politician does. Takes a poll and then changes his words, changes his actions. Paul says, whether I'm praised or criticized... By you, it doesn't mean a thing. This doesn't mean that he wasn't listening, taking counsel from godly people. Uh, when, when, he does, when he needed correction, it doesn't mean that he was not listening to it. There's a, there's a fine line there between looking at and thinking about uh, the criticism that's, that's pointed your way or the praise that's pointed your way. I remember so many preachers saying, you know, you got to take half the criticism that's coming at you. You got to be thick-skinned. You got to really, uh, you know, be able to just ignore it sometimes. And the same goes for praise. <laughs> when people praise you, don't 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 take it to heart. Again, we need to be very careful. Not to think that this means that you can't touch God's anointed. There is a, a large group of the church today that use that idea. You cannot, you should not touch God's anointed. You can't correct, you can't call out a false teacher or a preacher who is straying into heresy. There are passages after passage after passage we could go to that shows false teaching is to be confronted. Sometimes names are to be given so people can, can be careful to stay away from them. But Paul knew that his focus was on serving Christ. And he was being faithful to his commission. And he looked at and evaluated the Corinthians and where they were. And he saw what they were doing was so out of line with God's Word that their criticism towards him didn't faze him. He said, it... it, it the emphasis to me is, is in the Greek placed out front. He's like, to me, hey, you know, <laughs> to be evaluated by you, it means nothing. Paul says, I don't even judge myself, in fact. He says, my conscience is clear, but he says, that doesn't clear me. I'm not resting my confidence in a, in a clear conscience. He says, there is a day coming and I am going to be judged. And that's the one I'm concerned about. That's the one I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about and, and not worrying about, but that's the one that, I, that is serious to me. See it there, verse 4, the last part, it is the Lord who judges me. And he's referring to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says, oh, We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And that's not being judged according to whether you'll be saved or not. That is a Christian. That is a person who is saved, and they are then being judged for what they've done. Your work. There is an ultimate judge that we will stand before, Jesus Christ. And you know, the, the thought of uh, standing before an earthly judge is very intimidating, isn't it? It's frightening, really, to think that I've never stood before one, but to think that you stand before that judge, she or he receives the facts, and they make a verdict, and you have no say. <laughs> In fact, if you say something, you might just get more punishment, right? There's something very frightening about that, being totally out of control, being at the whim of someone else. Jesus is the one that every one of us are going to stand before someday. I found myself looking at a collection of pictures the other day over uh, in our bedroom by the fish aquarium. Our family, pictures of our family going all the way back to when the girls were just babies. 
And I looked at that and I thought, I wish I would have done things differently. You look at it and you think, uh, Melissa read me somebody's Facebook the other day and it was, uh, showed an old picture of her when she was young, some lady, and she said on there, if I could just go back and redo. <laughs> I looked at those pictures and I thought, if I could just go back and redo it. You know, someday we will stand before Christ and He will say, I called you, I chose you, I gifted you, I commissioned you. Now let's see what you've done with it. And it'll be like us looking at a wall full of pictures of what we've done. And we'll be thinking, I, I don't think any of us could look at this passage and say, I'm going to be really confident. I'm going to be really you know, excited for that moment. No, there's, there's, a, there's a real sense of none of us have done it like we should. And we're going to be looking back thinking, I just wish I could redo some things. His mercies are new every morning, right? We can change the way we're working right now. We can change the way we're living right now. <laughs> Look at verse 5. He says, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Bring to light things now hidden in darkness. Most, most commentators look at that word darkness and where often in Scripture we see it used to speak of evil deeds. Here everybody says, no, you know, it's, it's not talking about evil deeds. It's talking about the fact that you and I have so many things going on in our heart even while we are ministering to one another and seeming to be in such a caring way or maybe seeming to be harsh with one another, those things are not easily seen. They're, they're, they're going on inside. It's happening in a dark place, in an unknown place. And Christ is the one who can see through. And He can see that that harsh tone you used with that person really came from a good heart. Or that good tone you use with that person really came from a deceptive part of your heart. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment. Ultimate judgment of, of someone's ministry is what, what Paul is saying here. Whether you're, whether you're making a statement, whether you're making a judgment about my motives, whether you're making a judgment about my effectiveness, Christ is one who knows that. And I'm going to stand before Him and answer to Him on my ministry. And I love the way Paul ends that thought. Then each one will receive his commendation or his praise. Most translations have. Then each one will receive his praise from God. After all the wood, hay, and straw goes up in a puff and is gone, there will be some gold, there will be some silver, there will be some precious stones for Jesus to point at and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. What a convicting passage of Scripture for a pastor. <laughs> and for each one of us. In our work, in our ministry to one another, are we truly servants? Or do we humble ourselves enough to really see ourselves as, as a servant of one another, of Christ? Are we faithful stewards? Someday we will stand before Christ and He will make it very clear what we've done. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. How it acts as a mirror shows us ourselves. I pray that the Holy Spirit working on each one of us would reveal to us areas that need to change. Areas that we know may perhaps our, our motives are not pure, not clear. Help us to see ourselves, Father, as lowly slaves of Yours serving one another. But also, Father, as we look through Your Word, as we look through this treasure of 
revelation from you. Help us to understand our great responsibility to use that to build up, to encourage, to exhort, to correct one another. Father, I pray that you'll help all of us as we see again and again being stressed here that each one of us will be able to see uh, the teamwork that you are calling for, that we are one, that we are fellow workers, that as we minister to one another, we're all shooting for that same goal to see spiritual growth occur. Help us to humble ourselves, Father, when we, when we need to. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for that last verse, the, the idea that we will stand before you someday. We will be judged and there will be something to point at. Father, I pray for each one of us that we will make course corrections now, make changes, so that we can face that day with more confidence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.